telephone conversation between a language student and an advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents. Vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order, I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room. Personal effects, in other words. OK. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you. Pounds, that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say 50 as an absolute minimum. OK. Now, the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature is likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Now. Something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country. And secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had hers smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage? Usually, yes, but because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So my advice is to leave yours at home. OK, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things. They'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs, though I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes? Perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. Hmm. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address, just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark, Lewis and Amy Wark. 
So that's W A L K. <laughs> it's actually W A R K. But we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage, enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes, I'd recommend a change of T-shirt and socks and so on, plus any medication you may need, and a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. <laughs> Your tights. Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're flying long distances, not getting any exercise. Oh yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 meters without any help. You may have to do that. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. <laughs> you're welcome. Have a safe journey, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, and thanks everyone for coming here today. I know it's always a bit stressful going for a job interview, but it's best to be prepared. For any of you who may not know me, my name is Fiona Ogilvie, and my job is to offer guidance and support for students with special needs. Now, you wouldn't be here today if you weren't interested in finding a job in the holidays. So let's get down to it and see what things you need to be looking out for. Most of you, I hope, will be applying for jobs with the companies that have been recommended by the university. The reason for this is that we here at the university already know these companies and have established good working relationships with them. I've also been to visit all of them and checked out the facilities they have to offer. You really need to make informed choices when you're looking for a job and make sure you know before you even get to the interview stage that your needs will be met. But I know that some of you are applying for jobs independently and have looked at companies outside the university recommended list, so for you it's best to plan ahead and be aware of what it is you may need while you're working. Things that you need to check when you go for an interview are Are there enough toilet facilities and are these easily accessible? Also, you want to check that all the public areas inside the building are barrier-free so you can get direct access to these public spaces whenever you need to. And ask about ramps into the building, so you know how many there are and where they are located. These kinds of things are so much more difficult to sort out when you've started work, as they take time. But ramps are an absolute must, so please make sure you know where they are. Another thing you must make sure of 
is that the lifts have the correct lowered control panels. Ask if all the lifts have this facility, or if it's only certain ones. Now, something I think that is often overlooked is working hours. What you want to make sure of is that you get flexi time. This basically means that your working hours are flexible, and you can clock on and clock off in times that suit you, within reason, of course. Most companies do recognise that it takes much longer for someone in a wheelchair to get on and off buses and trains. Public transport can take that much longer, so you need to be organised and prepared. And for those of you lucky enough to own a car, check how many disability parking spaces are available. Remember that it's your right to have a disabled parking space. These also need to be near enough to a wheelchair accessible entrance or ramp. Okay, are there any questions before we move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Right, let's move on then. Now I want to talk you through the series of visits to companies which we've got planned for next week. On Monday morning, we will be visiting the Lowland Hotel. They have various summer jobs available, working as a receptionist or conference organizer in their busy conference center, organizing and setting up conferences. You need to be prepared for working in an office environment, and spending quite a bit of time talking on the telephone. The bus leaves for the hotel at nine a.m., so make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to get there. When you arrive at the hotel, please gather in the reception area and wait for someone to take you to your first session, which will be a talk. The talk at the hotel will begin at ten a.m. And then there will be a short tour of the hotel. There will be a light lunch provided, which is usually salads and sandwiches. The next place we'll be visiting will be on Tuesday afternoon. We'll be going to visit a little local company that makes handmade paper and cards. For those of you studying art, this may be just what you're looking for. We'll be taken on a tour of the company, which lasts three hours. The tour will start at 3:30 p.m., and after that, you'll have a chance to meet some of the staff. Tea and coffee will also be provided. We have no trips planned for Wednesday, but on Thursday morning, we'll be going to Tobago Travel Agency. This is a very popular choice amongst our students because you can get student discounts on holidays. We've booked a coach for this, and it'll leave from outside the refectory. At 8 a.m., you'll need to bring a packed lunch for this, so please don't forget. There is a little canteen where you can buy hot and cold food, but this is closed on Thursdays. Friday, we'll be having representatives from all the companies visiting us, so you will have a chance to ask any questions, and of course, put your name down on the list if you're interested in working for them over the summer. This event will take place in the main hall next to the library. And it'll run from 10:30 until 4. I really hope you make the most of this excellent opportunity to not only earn yourself some extra money, but also to gain experience of what it's like to work. And if you'd like to find out more, then please ask some of the students who worked last year. They're all wearing green badges and will be happy to speak to you afterwards. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between two students and their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, guys, first off, well done. That was a very good presentation yesterday. Now I'm just going to ask you questions about it before I give you my feedback. Is that OK? Sure. Of course. Right. Well, in that case, tell me, Niall, why did you choose to talk about Rafael Nadal? To tell you the truth, I didn't. I think I... Better let Sheena handle this one. Sheena? Yes, it was my decision to pick Nadal. Now, that might be a strange choice for a presentation entitled Someone Who Inspired Me to Study Psychology, but... Yes, but I was going to say, it does seem rather an odd choice. Was it simply down to the fact that he's a sporting hero of yours and so a role model? You talk about him a lot, Sheena, so this much is clear. It's true, Nadal is someone I look up to, but my reasons for choosing him were totally professional. You see, I doubt, perhaps in the history of tennis, that there was ever a better match player than him. And that got me thinking, what is the secret to his success? How does he control his nerves so splendidly? The more we started to look into his background, the more I realised Sheena was right. Nadal was a perfect candidate for this study. He is, on so many levels, a very well-balanced character, and it was fascinating to gain an insight into the mind of this great champion over the last few weeks. I'll admit that I was at first somewhat unsure about whether or not I should back Sheena on this one, but it didn't take long for our research to put us at ease. So, while most of the students were researching Freud and other visionaries in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis, you were looking into a present-day sports star? Does that not strike you as a little odd? Of course, we knew it was a risk. After all, there was a danger that no one, least of all you, would take us seriously. When we stood up on stage and started our presentation. That said, I think it is in the spirit of psychology to be inquisitive and adventurous and not just stick to the conventional. Otherwise, how would the field have come so far? as it has done already. Well, I must say, your risk certainly paid off. Yours was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most interesting and original presentation I saw. And judging by the reactions of the other students, I would have to say that everyone else was equally impressed. Thank you. I'm so glad you think so. Yes, but... Notwithstanding your excellent presentation content, we must remember that the marks for this project are awarded based on a number of criteria, and we'll examine those in a few minutes. But first, another question. Where did you find your sources? Well, and I don't quite know how we managed it, but we were able to secure a face-to-face -face interview with Nadal while he was over here for the Wimbledon Tennis Championship, so we won't rely on newspaper articles and interviews or any other forms of secondary sources. We did, however, find the library sports archive an invaluable backup aid to help us fill in the gaps and piece together our interpretation of what makes Nadal such a mentally strong champion. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK. Well, as I said, congratulations again for your excellent work. Now it's time for my feedback. 
The first area where marks were awarded is in your use of equipment. I felt that had you not been a little too reliant on the overhead projector, and had you, for example, used the interactive whiteboard and audio equipment a little more effectively, you would have received top marks in this section. As things stand, though, your use of equipment was still very satisfactory. It's just a shame as it was an opportunity missed to score full points. The next area I was asked to assess is content. As you might have guessed, I simply can't fault you on that. Highly original work, so well done. As for your timing, I felt that the two of you were a little too over-rehearsed, so the presentation felt, at times, a little robotic. That said, again, it was very satisfactory, and you would get full points for effort. Sadly, though, there is such a thing as trying too hard, and that cost you top marks here, I'm afraid. Oh, I see. Right. What was particularly impressive, though, was the thick handout you'd prepared for everyone. I took it home to read through it afterwards, and it was very well written. But not alone that, it also enhanced my experience of the presentation itself on the day, as I was able to refer to the handout for further information on what was being discussed and to answer any questions I had. Very nice. As for your level of interaction, well, you had so much that you were intent on packing into your 20-minute time slot that, sadly, you run out of time at the end, which left no room whatsoever for interaction and no one had the chance to ask you any questions. You've probably guessed, therefore, that you did worse than average in this department and, unfortunately, your score will have to reflect this. Oh, my goodness. Everything sounded so positive at the start. That is a big disappointment. We work so hard. Now, now, don't be so quick to get deflated. Remember, your presentation skills only count for 15% of the project grade. Your score in this assessment, even if it were terrible, would still not be enough to prevent you from getting top marks overall. It's very hard to score well in the presentation assessment anyway, so believe me, you both did reasonably well. Thank you. I wish I felt like that. Yes, your feedback was very constructive. We're just a little disappointed with ourselves. Why? That's the end of Section 3. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on two famous American presidents. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln lived in different times and had very different family and educational backgrounds. Kennedy lived in the 20th century, while Lincoln lived in the 19th century. Kennedy was born in 1917, whereas Lincoln was born more than 100 years earlier 
in 1809. As for their family backgrounds, Kennedy came from a rich family, but Lincoln's family was not wealthy. Because Kennedy came from a wealthy family, he was able to attend expensive private schools. He graduated from Harvard University. Lincoln, on the other hand, had only one year of formal schooling. In spite of his lack of normal schooling, he became a well-known lawyer. He taught himself law by reading law books. Lincoln was, in other words, a self-educated man. In spite of these differences in Kennedy and Lincoln's backgrounds, some interesting similarities between the two men are evident. In fact. Many books have been written about the strange coincidences in the lives of these two men. For example, take their political careers. Lincoln began his political career as a U.S. congressman. Similarly, Kennedy also began his political career as a congressman. Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1847. Kennedy was elected to the House in 1947. They went to the Congress just one hundred years apart. Another interesting coincidence is that each man was elected President of the United States in a year ending with the number six zero. Lincoln was elected President in eighteen sixty, and Kennedy was elected in nineteen sixty. Furthermore, both men were President during years of civil unrest in the country. Lincoln was president during the American Civil War. During Kennedy's term of office, civil unrest took the form of civil rights demonstrations. Another striking similarity between the two men was that, as you probably know, neither lived to complete his term in office. Lincoln and Kennedy were both assassinated while in office. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, after only one thousand days in office. Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, a few days after the end of the American Civil War. It's rather curious to note that both presidents were shot while they were sitting next to their wives. These are only a few examples of the uncanny and unusual similarities between the destinies of these two American men, who had a tremendous impact on the social and political life of the United States. And the imagination of the American people. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.